25 years. Let's think about that number for a second. 25 years. A quarter of a century. That is a lot of time. When you think about it in the world of television, a really successful television show on average that's been really, really successful and made a connection with its audience and kept it maybe last five to seven years. Sometimes they go 10. But they have breaks, they have off seasons, but not the WWE with Monday Night Raw. 25 years. Coming up in a few days, we're going to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of Raw. And while technically the 25th anniversary would have been January 11th, 2018, you get the point. 25 years. For all we can say about the WWE and their product and their changes over the years and this and that, that's an accomplishment. That is a hell of an accomplishment. Absolutely a significant major accomplishment. And I'm sure they'll be patting themselves on the back all three hours on Monday night. And honestly, they've earned the right to do so. It's crazy, man. Think back to 1993, January 11th. What was going on in the world at that time? Bill Clinton was nine days away from being inaugurated as the next president of the United States. Mike Tyson was serving time in prison for uh, being convicted of raping Desiree Washington. What else? The Chicago Bulls were back-to-back -back defending NBA champions and on their way a few months later behind Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen to winning their third straight NBA championship. The Dallas Cowboys were the defending NFL Super Bowl champions and they were going to be on their way to winning that championship. Excuse me, because I forget this was January 11th. They hadn't even won that Super Bowl yet. Good Christ almighty. The Blue Jays had just won the World Series. The Blue Devils had just won their second straight NCAA championship. Man, oh man. The Fab Five was taking the college basketball world by storm. Just incredible, incredible. 25 years later. Back when cross colors and Jenko and stuff, they were the thing. Anyways, I have to age myself too much. But I felt it was appropriate, looking ahead to the 25th anniversary of Raw, to take a step back with this retro wrestling review and review the first ever Monday Night Raw from January 11th, 1993 at the Manhattan Center in New York City, 25 years later. And I'll be honest. This is only the second time I've ever watched this show, and it has been years and years since I had watched it the first time. And it is striking the changes from production value standpoint, presentation, the product, the changes that there have been over the years, the names, the faces, some of the people on the show that are now dead, so on and so forth. There's a lot of things, some good nostalgia that goes along with it. But it was interesting to take a look back. Kind of a good choice too, in terms of watching an old show, because no matter what, in terms of actual stuff, since it was an hour broadcast, that first ever live episode of Raw, it means I was only watching like 41 or 42 minutes of Raw. It wasn't much. Just like this show, honestly, wasn't much. But let's take a look back at it and see what all the fuss was about. Sean Mooney is the first thing you see. He kicks it off. He's outside the Manhattan Center where we'd find Bobby Heenan trying to get in, but he can't, and they won't let him. This was a running theme throughout the course of the night, and it was really good stuff. It's also kind of odd that you made the choice on your first ever Monday Night Raw live on the USA Network that you would utilize Bobby Heenan in this way, that you wouldn't want him to be on commentary, that you would want to make him a punchline. But in that sense... It was kind of smart, too, because it put Bobby in his element where he could be on the fly, he could be a personality, he could be a character, and you weren't restricted to be that one thing. And throughout the night, Bobby Heenan was gold. If you go back and watch this first ever episode of Raw, if nothing else, you should be entertained by Bobby the Brain Heenan. And if not, then what is wrong with you? But we go from outside to inside the Manhattan Center, 
Big deal. Your commentary team for the evening. Holy crap. Vince McMahon, the Macho Man Randy Savage, and the man himself, the legend, the myth, all man, famous from his time on I Miss in the Morning, Mr. Rob Bartlett. Rob Bartlett, people. This is something still you could ask newer wrestling fans all these years later that maybe just got into wrestling 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. They might not know who the commentary team was for the first ever Monday Night Raw. You'd probably win a lot of bar bets with wrestling fans, asking them to name the three guys. They probably would get Vince. Some of them might get Macho. But how many of them are going to remember Rob Bartlett? And I promise you, you can't forget him after watching this first ever Raw. They say some weird, creepy, dumb stuff, and you could just tell the tone throughout the night was, as soon as Rob Bartlett opened his mouth the first time, Vince McMahon is sitting there like, ha <laughs> ha! Hey, what the hell did I sign up? What about, why is he here? Why did I do this to myself? And he was only there about three months as a commentator anyways because they didn't like what he was doing because he didn't know the business. He didn't care about the business. He was a comedian for Christ's sakes. But hey, they tried something different and oh baby, it was different. But you can look back at this time and you say with WWF that they, they still had purpose in everything they did. Like this first match, the first person you see Live, uncut, uncured, un uncooked. I, I don't know what the, I can't even remember. I, they didn't know throughout the course of the night the commentator, so why the hell should I remember? But Coco Beware is the first person that you saw. So it's somebody that transitions over from the 80s, somebody that was a part of that big boom era for the WWF. A lot of the fans are going to recognize, so you take a recognizable name and you throw them out there first. And then you bring in Yokozuna and his 500 plus pound ass. Obviously, you're going to take notice. Perfect opponent for him, Linda Coco Beware, a guy that could fly around, bump around a little bit, but there was a significant size difference. Like you could tell, Yoko was a big freaking dude, and you emphasize that here. But one of the highlights of this, maybe, were some of the Bartlettisms. Where, at different points in times, he quipped, that's one big Oriental. He's got an ass like an amphitheater. And don't regulations indicate he should have to wrestle in a bra? When you look back at some of the racial undertones to a lot of his humor, here's what I will say. Is War Rob Bartlett being better than anybody on WWE's commentary today? That's for damn sure. Because I laughed for many different reasons throughout all of this. And you could, again, when I'm talking about Vince, you could tell every time Rob Bartlett opened his mouth, Vince was with the quick, ha 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 ha, big guy. Laughed to shut him up and cut him off because he didn't know what the hell he was doing. But again, you're featuring Yokozuna here because you know you're going to have him win the Rumble in a couple of weeks. That's really why this show came to be at the time that it did, because this was trying to build up to the Rumble 93. That was the first real thing that was important to them. So you're hi highlighting the guy that would go on to be in that Rumble, win that Rumble, and then go on to win the title at WrestleMania until politics came into play, brother. So it made a lot of logical sense. Squash match with somebody you would recognize and somebody that you're going to know a whole lot about in 1993. After this match, you got the Bobby Heenan promo that was on VHS tape. They used to have those things where he's talking about the narcissist. I don't know why they didn't really get the flow down for saying the narcissist. But they, they said it in, like Vince did it and then specifically Bobby Heenan several times throughout the promo. And it was a good promo, him comparing the narcissist to Mr. Perfect. But it, it rolls so much better off the tongue when you say narcissist. 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 They were saying, Narcissist. It was just the one thing I couldn't get over. But, classic Bobby Heenan here. Not his best, but pretty damn good nonetheless. You come back from that, you got the Steiner Brothers versus the Executioners, because why the hell not? And here is the classic moment. This is the markout moment of the night for me. And there were a few markout moments here, don't get me wrong. But, you got the Steiner Brothers, so you're featuring these guys, and they've got a match against the Beverly Brothers at the Royal Rumble for the WWF Tag Team Championships. So obviously the Steiners are going to squash the Executioners here. But in the background, and it's a running theme throughout the night, it's Dork the Clown. And what made this so hilarious was after Rob Bartlett called him Dork, McClown, Dork the Clown, Vince McMahon, who, who had signed that born 
to be Doink the Clown, started calling him Dork the Clown, and then somebody, I think, had to tell him in his ear, or maybe Macho whispered it to him, that he was Doink the Clown. He called him Dork the Clown. Ladies and gentlemen, Dork the Clown. And imagine instead of having Dink or the Four Doinks, you could have had the Four Dorks. You could have had Dick the Clown. <laughs> oh, my God. Who gives a crap about the match? Let's all watch Dork the Clown, who's dead. Uh, you go away, come back, and now you see Bobby Heenan and Drag trying to get into the building when you've got, like, 15 other people standing outside. <laughs> like, you couldn't think to have, like, a whole mass of humanity paid to stand out there to make it look like it was such a big deal to get into the small-ass Manhattan Center. you got, like, 10 people that are probably all office employees. And here's Bobby Heenan and Drag <laughs> trying to get in. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And then we go in, and there's Razor Ramon. The bad guy. I can't really do a Razor Ramon, chico. I can't. I can't do a Razor Ramon. But I think that's part of the part of the kick on Scott Hall, Razor Ramon, is that he was such a parody of Tony Montana in Scarface. But he was still such a unique character. Like you look at somebody like a Razor Ramon, man, and the way he conducted and carried himself in this promo. How interesting it was that your first ever Monday Night Raw, it was live, and you chose to feature the guy that had only been around a few months. That was the number one contender that would be challenging your WWF champion at the Royal Rumble and Brett the Hitman Hart, who was nowhere to be seen on this entire show. No video package, no interview, no match, no nothing. That's crazy. Maybe it spoke to how much they really didn't believe in him as a champion in 1993, which was understandable, because if you remember in late 92, he beat Flair for the title at a house show in, what was it, Saskatoon? Or Saskatchewan, whatever the hell. Don't knock me with my Canadian geography, because I don't give a crap. What I did give a crap about was this Razor Ramon interview. And once they got the mic levels right, it was pretty good stuff. And then throwing the toothpick at Vince at the end, I'm like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it was good shit, though. But you look at this dude, and you're like, that's why we used to love about professional wrestling, these big personas, these larger-than-life characters, these dudes that did actually reek of machismo and charisma and cool factor. Like, that's the type of dude that even people that don't like professional wrestling and think it's stupid, they look at a dude like this and say, holy crap, that dude is pretty cool. Okay, he's okay. He's not one of those lame fake wrestlers. He's one of the cool fake wrestlers that I don't acknowledge in public that I like, but I'm secretly a fan of. Reza Ramon was one of those freaking guys. Then, the IC title match, Max Moon versus Shawn Michaels, was actually a little bit of a hidden gem. Sure, Lee, you're not going to say it's uh, Shawn Michaels' best, best work, and what, what more would you really expect out of Max Moon? I mean, seriously. But this match was actually not bad. It would still hold up today as a decent television match for a mid-card title. And it was interesting, again, that your world champion was nowhere to be seen on this show, but newly minted heel Shawn Michaels, who would be defending this strap against Marty Jannetty at the Royal Rumble... That he was on the show and wrestling in a competitive match against Max Moon. But it was hard to really concentrate on the match because at some point in time, for some reason, we just started breaking into Rob Bartlett's horrible impression of Mike Tyson. Talking about how he's watching this crap on TV in prison and he's going to watch the Like, this Mike Tyson impression was so bad it sounded absolutely nothing like him that it crossed over from being crappy, terrible doo-doo to being freaking epic. It did take away from the match, but frankly, who gives a crap? It was Max Moon and Shawn Michaels. Who cares? <laughs> I don't... I, don't <laughs> I know Mike Tyson was relevant at the time because he had just recently been thrown in prison for that rape, what have you, but golly, I don't know why they felt the need to bury Mike Tyson for several minutes, but they did, they did, with no real reason, they just did it, that was one of Rob Bartlett's sticks, but come on, crying minutely, and the last match of this show was Damian Demento versus The Undertaker, 
Now, uh, granted, it was The Undertaker. He was one of your big stars at the time, so of course you're going to feature him. This match wasn't very much. Um, it was about what you would expect out of a Damon, <laughs> Damien Demento and Undertaker match in 1993, okay? But that was the last match on Raw. Then, your go-home points, which was interesting, just because you would think, featuring The Undertaker, that would be the way you would end the show. But it ultimately revolved around Vince trying to interview Dork. I mean, Doink the Clown, and then Crush is coming out. <laughs> Talking about how he's going to put the rest of Doink and freaking sling his other arm and his two legs. And Doink squirts him with the water run, and they awkwardly have a chase scene around the ring. And that's pretty much it to where we end up the night with Sean Mooney saying that Bobby Heenan can finally go in as the show is going off the air. So what stood out on this show? Um, who they featured and how, and then in some cases who they didn't feature. You featured the guy that was going to go on to win the Royal Rumble and win the belt for a few minutes, a cup of coffee at WrestleMania 9. You featured the number one contenders to the tag team titles. You featured the number one contender to the world title. You featured your Intercontinental Champion. And you featured arguably your biggest star at the moment, at this time, and The Undertaker, or one of them at least, but you did not feature Bret Hart. You did not have Ric Flair on this show. Even though Bobby the Brain Heenan mentioned Ric Flair, you did not have Ric Flair, or Bret Hart, or Mr. Perfect on this first ever Raw. Just really, really weird. And again, I suppose in part, because of the fact you only have an hour of television for this one, again, that's something that's really striking as you go back and you know that Raw is three hours every week now. They started off with this one hour squash show. This almost felt like a glorified version of an old studio show, which is pretty much what it was. It doesn't really hold up well over the test of time, but it's like night and day in terms of production values and different things. But still, you look back at some of the characters and the way presented them, there was at least purpose and reason for a lot of the people that were featured. You just couldn't feature every single buddy on this first show. Um, so that was something to be said. Like I said, that icy title match between Max Loon and Shawn Michaels is probably better than people remember, better than they give it credit for. You know, and it's funny to go back and watch Bobby Heenan in his element. And Vince McMahon, Macho Man, and Rob Bartlett on commentary for an hour is freaking gold. I don't give a crap. Even though the show wasn't very good from just the way it flowed and everything else, and the matches in general were quick squashes and nothing really to write home about, especially to what we've been programmed to see on TV in recent years. In the show, in general, doesn't hold up very well. There's still some nostalgia factor there. And if nothing else, the commentary for an hour should entertain the hell out of you. And maybe you'll get a couple of nice surprises. Just be careful. Dork the Clown doesn't squirt you with his... Dork the Clown. Dork the Clown! <laughs> Anyways. So that's my review of the first ever edition of Monday Night Raw. January 11th, 1993. In a couple of weeks, we'll be doing another retro wrestling review, so feel free to give your suggestions in the comments to this video. Uh, feel free to go back if you're trying to get excited for the 25th anniversary Raw. Go watch this first ever Raw. You can find it here on YouTube, and it's a good reminder of where they started and where it is now. Gives you some more appreciation for where they are now, even though there's still are some good things about going back in 1993, which was really a down year for this company in general, let's be honest. Um, but if you're looking for something else to get you excited specifically for the 2018 Royal Rumble, make sure you check out the Royal Rumble Review Series. That link to that entire playlist is in the description box down below. Make sure you go to Pro Wrestling Tees and buy the official OTRS Central t-shirt. Damn you, do it, do it now! And most importantly of all, never forget that I'm the Slight Daddy and this is OTRS Central. Not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Later.